He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And nobody gets to the Father except through Him. So if you are in Christ, guess what? He is your way. He is your truth. He is your way to heaven. And that's all there is to it. I want to welcome any guests that are here this morning, and I pray that you're just going to be blessed today and hear the Word of God and, and see what God's doing in your life. Hopefully God will bless you and, and you'll enjoy this day and be encouraged, maybe a little bit challenged, I don't know, it's whatever the Lord has in store. Uh, but before we do that, uh, do we have servers for communion this morning? Uh, if you could come forward. Uh, so... Yeah, okay. Uh, come on up. Uh, go ahead and serve the elements. Let me just read out of Luke. And uh, the Lord gave us this one ordinance, uh, and I think it's a good time at the beginning of service to remember what the Lord has done for us. Uh, we live in a world that's difficult right now and some interesting times, and so we're going to need God more than ever. <laughs> In the times that we're living in, right? And so this is a good time to remember what God has done. Jesus, uh, God sent His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, if, you, if you believe that, say amen. He sent His only begotten. Why did He do that? So that we could have eternal life. So that we will be able to, to join Him when we pass from this life. We pass on to uh, the, His presence. We're in His presence forever, for eternity. You know how long eternity is? Uh, yeah. How long is forever? Pretty long time, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's a pretty long time. And so God had sent His Son. Jesus had come. Jesus knew what He had uh, come to do. And uh, throughout His whole life, uh, He knew that He had come to die. And then when He started his, into His ministry in His three, three and a half years of, of just... Uh, really entering into his ministry, uh, even though we can see him in the temple at 12, I mean, all of his life. I mean, he is God-man, right? He is God in the flesh, uh, born of a virgin. But he knew all of his life that he had come to die and that uh, through him the world would be saved. Now, is all the world going to be saved? Meaning, are all the people in the world going to be saved? No. Why not? Because some are going to live in unbelief. We're going to look at that today. Uh, and so it's not, not everybody's going to go to heaven because if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, if you've never invited him into your life, if you never believed and repented and you haven't truly lived for him and you're not living for him now, guess what? You, you don't make it. Okay? It's through Jesus Christ. It's through his son. It's through what he did on the cross. It's, it's through the blood of Christ. It's, it's through the death and the burial and the resurrection right? that, that we have eternal life. And so this cup... And this uh, cracker represents his body and his blood. His body and his blood. And he was trying to tell them that night what he had come to do. But they still didn't fully understand what he was about to do. In fact, they wouldn't realize it until after he came back for 40 days and appeared to them. And then they began to realize what he was talking about. The Last Supper of the Passover, he was eating with his disciples, and he was given this illustration. This is one of the ordinances, That's this in baptism. And he took the bread, he lifted it toward heaven, and he gave thanks. You know what he said? He says, I fervently have desired to eat this Passover with you. And so he broke the bread, blessed it, and said, this is my body that is broken for you. He said, take and eat in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And likewise, he took the cup. And what I like, what he said, and this is something that I always try to emphasize in the blood. He says, this wine represents the new covenant all things become new this is the new covenant and it is shed for you and do this in remembrance of me don't we have a wonderful savior 
Amen. A wonderful God, a merciful God, a great God. Uh, there's a couple things that I just want to talk about here uh, briefly before we get totally into the message, and that is, um, uh, and it's it's for our uh, our our regular attenders and church members here and stuff like that. One thing that you have noticed, those who attend here for any length of time, I don't talk about money a lot. Um, and I had, if anybody remember Rudy, <laughs> Rudy old good old Rudy Rottler, he never thought, he thought I never talked about it enough, right? Uh, and, but I believe that we have an obligation uh, to fulfill what God has called us to do. He says when he was challenged with taxes, he says, give unto Caesars that which is Caesars, and give unto God's that which is God's. And we also see in Malachi chapter 3 that God calls us to give. And tithe is tenth. And this is all I'm going to say because we don't pass the plates here. We, we leave, you know, uh, we're, we're supposed to be good stewards of what God gave us. And, and so I just want to, uh, you know, remind us why we give. We don't give just to keep the lights on here. We don't give just so the ministry can continue to operate, though those things happen. We give because it's obedience to God and we love God first. That's what tithing is. Uh, a pastor once said, uh, want me to tell you where a man's heart is? Let me tell you where he spends his money. And so... Tithing is one of those things where we are obedient to God, to give a tenth, to give a tithe to, the, to Him, back to Him. And through that, we're able to operate in a way that hopefully blesses God, uh, uh, extends the ministry, extends the gospel to the world. That's the whole purpose. But mainly the reason we give is obedience to Lord Jesus Christ. Obedience to Lord Jesus Christ. And you can see that in our tithes and offerings, eventually, you know, we have enough reserve to kind of keep us flowing. But eventually those reserves run out. And then if that happens, whatever God does, we'll just have to make different decisions in what we do. And so I would challenge you this morning that, uh, that we give in obedience to God. And again, those of you, I mean, does anybody remember the last time we even talked about this, about stewardship? It's been a long time, because I don't want to harp on that. A lot of people say, well, that's all the pastor ever talks about is money. I just want to give us a reminder of why we give and what the offering is all about. The other thing is, I want to, in your bulletin, and I'm going to get to the message here, I promise, in your bulletin are QR codes. Okay, QR codes. People are always saying, you know, if you can't, I can't find the message. If I'm not here, I can't find you. Um, if you go to your phone and you go to your camera and you just point your camera to this QR code right here, a little white box or something pops up, you just click on that, it takes you right directly to our website. Okay, you just you put, pull your camera up, point it right there, it'll take you directly to our website. Okay. And that's how easy that is. Give it a try sometime. See if it works. If it doesn't, come and talk to me or somebody, and we can help you through that, okay? Uh, and then as Nancy had mentioned, the National Day of Prayer on May, on May 2nd. What we're going to do is we're going to open the doors here. I believe that we need to be in prayer for this nation. Do you believe that? I believe we need to be in prayer for this nation. This nation and the world is falling apart, okay? And if we're not on our knees praying... We shouldn't expect different, re different results. Hopefully you're already doing that at home. Hopefully you're already praying for our leaders. Hopefully you're, hopefully you're already praying for our nation. And hopefully you're already praying for the world. But at 8 o'clock, we're going to open these doors, and we're going to go till 6 o'clock. We have 12 stations around this church that will be set up. It gives you what to pray for. It gives you the scriptures to read. And if you will take five minutes, just five minutes at each station you will have prayed for one hour. And what I'm asking the church to do, would you come out on May 2nd while these doors are open? The, uh, we always have the lights a little dimmer so you can just focus on, on prayer. Uh, we'll have some, just some light hymns 
uh, like piano hymns playing in the background to church, just to, so you can focus on God and pray for this nation. So I'm asking the church to come out on May 2nd, any time between 8 and 6, and come into the sanctuary and just pray for one hour. Remember when Jesus went up to the mountain and he took a couple of disciples with him? And he goes a little further up and he comes back. And what did he find him? Found him asleep. Can't you pray for just one hour? Remember that? And so what we're gonna, what I'm encouraging us to do, come in during that time, May 2nd, between 8 and 6, come in and pray to each station. Just spend five minutes and you will have prayed for one hour. And pray for this nation and pray for the things that are going on in this nation and in this world and that God would be revealed. Amen. We're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 4 today. I'm going to read these, the, this whole thing all the way through because it really sets the groundwork for what I want to talk about today, and that is resting in Christ, resting in Jesus, resting in God. Just resting in Him. You know, there is rest for the weary soul. And believe me, there's a lot of people out there right now that are in need of rest. Have you ever had a night where you just couldn't sleep? You wake up the next morning and you just feel all energized, don't you? No, you don't. You're, wake, you, you're just dragging, you know, and, and all the way through the day, you're just dragging. I remember just this last week, I was talking to, to Gala, and I, I go, it's just so frustrating. I must not have had a good night's sleep, and... Either that, it's just my age catching up to you, me, because that's what all the ones that are older than me are telling me. Just wait, you haven't seen nothing yet, right? And, and I'm in my office, and I'm preparing the message. It's like 10.30 in the morning. And all I, all I remember is doing this. I go, and I thought, about, I thought to myself, I go, what is wrong with me? <laughs> you know, and then when my mind isn't, Focus when my mind is tired, when my, when my mind and my body didn't have enough rest, it has a hard time concentrating. You ever have that same problem? And so I go in and I'll just lay down for 10 minutes. So I lay down for about 10 minutes, I was good to go for the rest of the day. And it just frustrates me. Well, guess what? Our soul and our life get weary and tired. Sometimes we get tired of the mundane things in life. Sometimes we're tired about the things going on in the world. Sometimes we're tired of the politics. We're tired of the financial problems. We're tired of the relationship issues. We're tired, tired, tired. And then as you get older, it just seems like life just kind of constantly just beats you down and beats you down and beats you down and beats you down. And, beats you down. And, and pretty soon, maybe you become skeptical. I don't know. Maybe you can relate to some of those things. I don't know where you are. Uh, necessarily right now and how you're feeling. But you know, there's rest for the soul. There's rest for us in God. We may not have rest in this world because we're still in the world, but there's rest for the soul because we know that our final rest isn't here in this world. It's there in the presence of the Lord. Amen? And so we can rest assured that we have rest in Him. And I want us to get to this point where we just believe in Him. And my daughter and I were talking this morning a little bit, and we, we, we feel this presence of evil in the world. We can feel it in our life. We can feel it uh, in our family. We can feel it in the world. We can feel it at the workplace, wherever we work. We can feel it anywhere. We feel this oppression of evil. We can see the work of evil, and that how God or, or, or how Satan works in men for evil, and we're, we're, you know, we're saying, is there any rest for the soul? Yes. You know, we don't have to worry about evil because we have faith in Christ. But the problem is sometimes, or maybe are not a problem, but what we do is we don't have rest because of unbelief. We say we believe, we say we know God, and that's why the first bullet point, I was thinking, the first bullet point, I should, say, I should have said it this way, the difference between knowing about God and actually knowing Him. Because a lot of people know about God, a lot of people have come to church, at, but yet they're living a lifestyle that is outside of, of, of what is pleasing to God, and it's an abomination to God. See, we can know all about God, 
You can know all the scriptures. You can have it all memorized. But it does nothing if you don't have belief and faith in Him. Because you can still know the scriptures. I knew people who knew the scriptures inside and out to make an argument against, uh, uh, or a, uh, I guess an argument against what I believe. They didn't believe scripture. They didn't believe in God. They weren't a Christian, but they knew scripture because they would try to use it against me. You know anybody like that? I've read the Bible all the way through, so it doesn't matter. Do you have, you can read the Bible, you can know the Bible, you can know about God, you may even have a close experience with God, but if you don't have Him in your life, and you're living a lifestyle that's outside of God, and you're not really truly living in faith, it means you have unbelief in your life, guess what? There's no rest for that soul. And that's what we're going to see. There's no rest for the soul. It's unbelief. And so, in this unbelief, then, we have all these problems and worries and concerns, and we sometimes have all these worries and, and doubts and concerns because of unbelief, and we don't really believe, truly believe God's going to do this or do that in our life. I said this one, we had this conversation with somebody just this week. You know, one person's praying for, praying for sunshine, one person's praying for rain, who's God going to please? Right? But it doesn't matter if it's sunny outside, or snowing, or rainy, or frosty. We had a frost freeze warning this morning. Okay? What matters is that you have a faith and a belief in God, so much so that no matter if the rain or the snow or whatever comes into your life, you have so much faith in God that nothing moves you. That you believe. That you know that, that things are going on and I don't like my situation here and I don't like what that person said over there and, and I don't know why I have to struggle so hard over, over this. But we can have rest for the soul knowing that all things work together for good for those who are in Christ. Amen? Everything. You believe that. And if you do, then live in the belief, live in the faith that you say that you have. And guess what? When you do that, guess anything that comes in, you can go, hmm, that's a problem. Hmm, okay, well, I guess I'll have to do this or I'll have to do that. I don't like it. But you know what? God works all things together for good. And I'm in Him, and I believe, and I have faith, and I don't want to live in unbelief, so therefore, I'm trusting God with it all. We can have that kind of rest in this world, knowing that... In this world, we're still going to have troubles and problems, but our goal isn't here. We're going to die. Everybody in this room, this body is going to give out. It's not going to last forever, but one thing that does, your soul, and you will live for, with God in eternity with Him. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank You so much for Your Word. I praise you, Lord God, for what you're going to show us today. I pray, God, that you help us overcome the, the difficulties in life. I don't know where people are here this morning, Lord Jesus, but I pray, God, that if there's any unbelief right now, that it would be, be gone and out, out. And we would put faith, and we would put our trust in you, Lord Jesus, knowing that we can rest in you. We have rest for the soul, even in this world that is dying. I pray, Lord God, that we would have that kind of strength to trust in you, to believe in you, to know, God, that you're working all this stuff out. And Lord, we just want to surrender it all to you today. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look in Hebrews chapter 4. It won't take long to get through this. We'll go through the whole chapter. Okay? Uh, so he starts off in chapter 4 as a therefore, and whenever there's a therefore, it means he's given... Uh, he, he's continuing a thought previously. So he's continually thought, continual continuing the thought of, of Hebrews chapter 3, okay? And we're going to cover some things in, in chapter 3 just briefly, okay? But here it goes. It goes, therefore, since, since a promise remains of entering his rest, there's a promise to enter his rest, okay? The promise, and, and a, let, us, let us fear lest any, you, any of you seem to have come short of it. What does that mean? We have fear? No, I thought we were just having rest. Is this a play on words? No, he says, look, you go, we have fear in God because of who he is. It's a reverential fear. It's not that we fear God. Now, the world should tremble in fear of God. But if you're in Christ, guess what? We, we fear in reverential fear. 
saying, oh my God, you are, the, you are the King of kings. You know all things. And so we have this reverential fear of God. So that's the kind of fear he's talking about, saying we have rest in Him because we have a reverential fear for Him and we know that He's seeing after us and we know that we can't do anything in and of ourselves by ourselves alone, that we need His help. So we see Him and we, we reverence Him and we have fear for Him in reverence knowing that all things are working together for good and we're coming to God broken in the broken pieces and He's going to put the pieces of our life back together and we're coming to Him in reverential fear. That's what this means. Lest any of you seem to come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. Now, the book of Hebrews, <laughs> I don't get very far, do I? <laughs> I get like one thought and I got another thought coming. Okay, I haven't even got to my notes yet. But what it says here, the, the, you got to re- understand that, that, that the book of Hebrews is written to the Christian, the believer. Okay, the believer. But there's a lot of warning for non-believers in here. And it's mixed in here. He'll say, here's what the believer has, and here's what the non-believer is going to suffer if they don't turn and become a believer in unbelief. They need to turn into faith. Uh, And, of course, it's talking about Judaism here. It's talking really about the old traditions, sacrifices, and stuff like that. All of Hebrews is saying, you don't need those old sacrifices anymore. All you need is Jesus Christ. Okay? That's what this means here. Okay? So, it goes on, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with what? Faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished, from the foundation of the world, for he has spoken a cert, uh, in a certain place on the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. What they're talking about? Creation. Right? So what, the writer of Hebrews is taking us all the way back to the beginning here. Okay? And it goes, and again, in this place they shall not enter my rest, since therefore... It remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Now what's he talking about? He's still, now he's talking about the disobedience coming out of Egypt, walking around in the, in the wilderness for 40 years. You see how he's, he's pulling all this stuff together? He's reminding them of all this stuff, okay? Um, because of their disobedience. Again, uh, He designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And that's what the world does. It hardens the heart. It hardens it so much that no longer can God even reach him. Listen to what it goes on and says here. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. In other words, you can't find rest in Joshua, even though Joshua took them over the Jordan and they defeated defeated Jericho and and eventually Ai. You know, there were some problems there with Achan, but, but, uh, you know, eventually, you know, he did. But... Uh, he goes, if Joshua had given you this rest, he wouldn't have spoken another day. It says, but our rest is in who? God. Our rest is in God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is what? Living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow. That's pretty deep, isn't it? And is a what? Discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. There's nothing you can do from God. There's nothing you can do in secret. There's nothing that you can ever hide from God. So don't even try. So whatever you think, I was talking about the Jerichos last week, putting that Jericho, breaking down those Jerichos around that part of your heart that God wants in, that you won't let him around. He already knows about it, but guess what? He wants you to drop those walls. Okay? That's what he says. I stand at the door and knock. He who opens the door. 
You must open the door to let him in. Let's look down at verse 13. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Yes, every king, every queen, every president, every senator, every congressman, anybody in power, anybody that, that has ever lived, any pastor, any church member, anybody who has ever, ever lived is going to give an account to God of their life. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Nobody is immune. Everybody will stand equal before him and give an account of their life. Verse 14, seeing then we have great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. Isn't that great? Let us confess Him. Let us confess our weaknesses. Break down the barriers that are holding you back from Him, for there's nothing that He doesn't already know that He can't help you with your weakness. But was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help and help in time of need. You know what that means? That means I am in Christ. I can come boldly. Yes, I have a reverential fear for God, but I can come boldly before Him because I know who I am in Jesus Christ and I can conquer all things that come into my life. And it doesn't matter what the world can do to me. It doesn't matter if my finances collapse. It doesn't matter if the world collapses. It doesn't matter if the 401ks and the Social Security checks quit coming it doesn't matter he will provide your need and he will take care of you and he will uh, provide for everything that you you ever need in this life that's the god we serve but so often i think we 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 depend on our 401k we depend on our social security check check we depend on government more than we depend on god i'm not saying there's anything wrong with those things Plan for the future. Plan for retirement. Those more money said about money and possessions and things in the Bible than just about anything. Plan. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't make it your end goal. Because eventually, guess what? You're going to die and leave it all behind. Solomon's writing Ecclesiastes. He goes, vanity, vanity, vanity. All is vanity. Everything I've ever done is vanity. What's he talking about? Well, I had everything I ever needed. But when it comes down to this, I'm at the end of my life and none of it meant anything. I'm just going to leave it all behind for somebody else to squander it all away. The only thing that lasts forever, the only thing that we have is Jesus Christ. That's our gift. That's our goal. That's our rest. That's His mercy. That's His grace. He gave us something we don't deserve through His Son, Jesus Christ, so that we can have eternal life. That is the greatest gift, to let us hold bold the confession that we have in Him and stand in the faith that we know that we have. And don't walk around in unbelief, but walk around in faith, in confidence, coming boldly to the throne of God, knowing who you are in Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. Amen? You can know all about God. You can know all the Scripture, but if you have unbelief, and if you don't come to Him in faith and live in the faith, and you have unbelief, then you might be in danger. But many will say, Lord, Lord, and not enter the kingdom of heaven. It's unbelief. It's not believing. And that's what really the writer of Hebrews was telling us. You can go all the way back to Hebrews 1.3. And this is what it says in Hebrews 1.3. It says, God's Son shines out with God's glory. And all that God's Son's, uh, all that's God, and all that God's Son is and does marks Him as God. You know what that just said? He's my Son. He's in flesh, but He's fully God. And it says, He regulates the universe By the mighty power of His command. He is the one who died and cleanses us and clears our record 
for all sins. Satan's mad, that's all. Don't worry about it. And then set down the highest honor beside the heaven. Listen to what this scripture says. Faith, belief. A lot of people will say, oh, I believe, I believe God. Uh, oh, I mean, I believe that Jesus existed. This is why I always say, ask an open-ended question, okay? Then to you, who is Jesus? Well, he was a good prophet. He was a good teacher. He was an honest man. Oh, really? Can you be a good prophet and an honest man and a good teacher if you're a liar? Well, what do you mean? Do you believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven? No. Then you're calling Jesus a liar. Because in John 14, 6 says, What? What's it say, Nancy? I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody come to the Father except through Him. Did I throw you off there a little bit? Nobody come to the Father. So Jesus is either either a liar, and if you're lying in one thing, you're a liar in all things, because a half-truth is a whole lie. So he is either a liar or he is telling you the truth. He cannot be doing both. Right? Well, if he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, nobody comes to the Father except through me. That was fast. Uh, (laughs) I was laughing. Uh, You know, we had the men's breakfast yesterday. And Fred's not here, so I can't really peck on him too much. You know, he goes, but you're you're too techie, you're too savvy, you talk too fast. And I go, I know, but I can't help it listen a little faster, I'll try and talk a little bit slower, and maybe somewhere in the middle we can meet. Right? But Jesus either is the way or He's not the way. And the writer of Hebrews right here absolutely confirms it. Listen to it one more time. God's Son. Who is it? God's Son shines out with who? God's glory. Okay? Shines out with God's glory. And all that God's Son is and does marks Him as God. Writer Hebrews says it right here. Who is Jesus? He's the man who came to die, fully man, fully God. Because it goes on here, He regulates the universe by the mighty power of His command. Now listen to this. A, He is the one who died to cleanse us and clear our record of all sin and then sat down in the highest honor beside the great God of heaven. The Savior of the world. Jesus Christ. Unbelief. Don't let unbelief keep you out of the kingdom of heaven. If you truly believe in Jesus Christ. Walk in that faith. Know who you are. Don't be afraid to call out the lies. Don't be afraid to expose the untruths. Speak truth. This week, I'm just going to go on the record here. I might lose half of you. I don't know. This week, Article 9, Title 9, I don't know if you know anything about this. It has to do with all the LGBTQ and the transgender stuff. Okay? And they are passing, I think it's still got to go through the Senate. It's got to go through some of the other things in the House and stuff, you know, to get, to get it passed. But it allows any man who dresses in women's clothing to enter any locker room, to enter any where they want to go without consequences. Go look at Article 9. I'm not, don't believe me. Go look it up for yourself. And so what I'm saying here, we have two bathrooms, a men and a women's. Any man who goes into the women's restroom, especially when a woman is in there, the police will be called and they'll be escorted out of this building and they will be asked never to return to this church ever again. Okay? Because Jesus and Romans chapter 1, and that, by the way, 
we need to pray for them. You know why? Because they're living, we all know someone. I have wayward families that, that love or that, that know Jesus, that understand the Word, but they're living in an abomination to God. And that's why I was saying that uh, I don't judge people. I am, I am just mainly, uh, purposely giving you the Word on how God judges you. I'm not judging you. I'm telling you what the Word says. And then it's up to you as an individual to live your life any way you want to. I am not going, I'll treat you the same. It's up to you how you live your life for Jesus. Okay? Here's what the Word says. Here's what the Word of truth is. And this is what, says, what God says it is, is an abomination. And those who are living in unbelief, and those who are not living, who say they know God, but still living outside of the will of God, we already saw this in the last couple of weeks, that you're not of God. I didn't say that. Scripture did, and I pointed it out time and time again. You see. You can't have both ways. If we truly are committed to Jesus Christ, if we are truly committed to Him in faith, guess what? Even if we have natural tendencies to drift over here or to drift over there, we should be miserable in that life because we know we're not in the will of God. And we need to be praying for those who are outside of the will of God and love them into the kingdom. Okay? So when I say we escort them out, we also pray. And we pray that they will see how God wants them to live their life. And they will be received back in, you see. Because if they were escorted out in that fashion, if they truly came to know Jesus Christ, and Christ would have truly received them back in, then what are we to do? Receive them back in. Amen? That's how it works. That's how it works. And so in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, it says, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they uh, heard did not profit them. Did you hear that? It didn't profit them. Not being mixed with faith who had heard it. So they heard the Word. They knew the Word. They might have been in church in our generation. They, they understood the Word. They knew about God, but they were living outside of the boundaries from which God says, this is how you are to live. And so it didn't profit them to know that. <laughs> wow. Uh, okay, he says to those who refuse to believe... That when trouble comes near and you call out his name, you will not find him. Listen to what this This is a really sad state to be in. And I don't pray anybody be in this state. It says in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 27 through 32, listen to what it says. When your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord. They would have none of my counsel and despised every rebuke. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of what? Their own way. People go, well, why does God condemn anybody to hell? He doesn't. We put ourselves there. As the Scripture here, we reap the fruit of our own demise, of our own way. You see how that is? And it goes on, and be filled to the full of their own fancies, for turning away of the simple will uh, of the simple will slay them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. Again, I'm not. Ju- I'm sitting here. All I'm doing is telling you what God's word says. I'm just telling, and so hopefully we can we can align our life with Him more. If you turn away from God, if you ignore His voice, ignore His voice. If you refuse to live in faith, then you may be in danger of your own destruction. That's what it says. You're in danger of your own destruction. Many want to blame God. 
Don't blame God because it's on us. But listen to this, okay? The Bible says that if you have faith in Him, He will listen to you and He will help you and you will be saved. Listen to what it says in Proverbs 1.33 for those who are living out a life of faith. But whoever listens to me will dwell safely, will be secure, Without fear of evil. So all the evil that goes on around you, all the things that come into your life, you're not going to fear those things. Why? Because you're in Christ. You have faith in Christ. You believe in Jesus. You know what God's going to do. And so your faith is is driving you. So no matter what happens, it's not going to move you. You're going to stay steadfast. Then Matthew 11, 28 and 30 says this, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, And learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, but my burden is light. We are warned not to harden our hearts, to walk in faith, to walk according to the Scriptures. No matter how hard that might be. Like I said, you have tendencies to go here or go there or live any way you want. You know what? God says, here's how I want you to live your life. And so a living sacrifice means we put the natural tendency of man, the, things we, the way we want to live, away and live it to God. That doesn't mean that those things go away necessarily. You battle, battle those for the rest of your life maybe. But if you want to live for Him, if you faith, have faith in Him, you want to live for Him. And so no one will enter into God's rest of eternity if they don't believe And that's what Hebrews, looking back at Hebrews 3.19, it says, uh, so we see they could not enter, uh, they could not enter, that's the kingdom, because of unbelief. If your heart is hardened, if you refuse to believe in God, if you refuse to live the way He told you that He wants you to live, and He commands you to live, then we are told three times in chapters 3, 7 through 4, 7, to be careful because you're in danger of hardening your heart toward that. Don't ever violate your conscience. That's why conscience is so important. Once you violate your conscience, you violate it again, and you violate it again, and pretty soon your conscience becomes severed. And you no no longer have remorse. You no longer have remorse. So Hebrews 3, 7 and 8 says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. That's the wanderings in the day of trial trial in, in the wilderness. Hebrews 3.15, it says, where, uh, while it said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Again, in, in Hebrews 4.7, again, he designates a certain day saying in David today, after such a long time as it has been said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Be open to his word. To live the way we're supposed to live for Him. Okay? Don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. And you can see what they were talking about the rebellion. Always going back to the rebellion. In Numbers 14, 22 and 23 says, Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have uh, put me to the test uh, now these ten times, and have not heeded my voice. They certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. If you reject God, now this is crossing over the, 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 the promised land. Remember, Joshua was the one, the one that's going to take him over. But guess what? Same thing rule applies to us. If we harden our heart, we sever our conscience, and we aren't following God, and we're not living in the faith that we're supposed to be living in, and we say we love God, but we're living over here in sin, um, guess what? We will not, or you or whoever, will not cross over into the promised land. Heaven. That's our promised land. It's heaven. And so we got to do everything we can to live according to the truth that God gave us. Amen? Don't reject it. Don't harden your heart. I'm going to go through this really fast, okay? What is resting in God then? I think I pretty much, hopefully, described that. No matter what goes on in your life, no matter what's going on in the world, you can have rest for your soul. And when you have rest for the soul, there are three things you can have. First, you have relief from self-effort. means you don't do things on your own. Everything now you're relying on God for. 
We think we're so big, and we think we can do everything on our own, and our own self-effort, we can't. We can't save ourselves. I can't even save you. The pastor can't save you. Only Jesus Christ can save you. So we're free from uh, all of our own self-effort, okay? We have relief from worries. How many of you worry? Don't really raise your hand, okay? How many of you worry? Why? Does, <laughs> what's that? Yeah, it's human nature to do that, right? Okay, he says, don't worry. Does worry add any time to your life at all? No, it only takes it away. I wake up, and look, I'm guilty. I wake up in the middle of the night worrying about this or that, and things will pop into my mind. And, and I'm just, all of a sudden, I'm worried about something. You know, I wake up, and why am I worried about that? Well, I, I didn't even know I was thinking about that, but I guess I was, because now I'm worried about it. You see? And then I can't sleep, so I get up and usually have a bowl of cereal and then do what I'm not supposed to do, go back to bed and get fat, you know, because all that calories and stuff just sits there and you don't work it off. You know you do it too, okay, so at least some of you do. But we have relief from our worries, okay? Don't worry about things. Don't stress out about it. Oh, it's the hardest thing to do, isn't it? <laughs> Look. I have stresses just in ministry. I'm stressed out about stuff. You know, and, and guess what? I have a personal life that I... Did anybody just have to go through April 15th? Does anybody ever stress out about taxes? I don't like that time of year. Right? It goes, so, you know, here's the IRS. Okay, you got to go do your taxes. Well, can you tell me how much I owe? No, you need to figure that out. Oh, so you don't know how much I owe? Oh, yeah, we know how much you owe, but we still want you to figure it out. What if I do it wrong? Ah, eh, you go to jail. There's no stress there. Right? <laughs> See how this is? It's, it's nuts. Okay? Okay, so we have relief from worry. I'm not going to worry about it. I did what I could do. I paid my taxes. You know, give unto God what's God. Give unto Caesar what's Caesar's. Pay your taxes. I don't like it like anybody else. Okay? But I'm not going to worry about it because I have a Savior that one day, guess what? I'm not going to pay taxes anymore. I'm not going to have a tax collector. Worry about a tax collector showing up on my doorstep. I'll be in, you know... Presence of God, i got to hurry up here. Confidence in life is what you're going to have, okay? Until so you walk around in confidence, okay? You can walk around head up. Don't walk around. So many Christians are walking around. How's your day? Oh, my day's good, you know. You know, and, 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 and they're moping around, and they don't even, where's your joy? Well, there's nothing to be joyful. Of. Well, you can be joyful in the Lord. No, but I got this, 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 this. So, why are you worried about it? What can you do to change it? Not a whole lot. Okay, then live your life. Okay, live your life. Walk around in confidence, know that all things work together for Christ, all things work together for good for those who are in Christ. Okay? See, even my brain is ahead of my mouth. Yes, it is, Taylor, and you're right. Okay. Let me just I got a ton of, we're gonna pass over all that, okay? <coughs> Let me just give you the last few. Okay? Fear of the Lord is peace. You have peace in your spirit. You have peace when you walk. You have peace when you wake up. You have peace when you lay down, knowing that God is working all things together. Right? And those who are with, living in unbelief, guess what? They should worry. They should fret. They should wonder, what happens when I die? Okay? But you have rest in Jesus. Okay? Proverbs 9, 10, and 11 says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That reverential fear I was talking about. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding, for by me your days are multiplied. And people are going, oh, I'm like up in years. I don't want my years to be multiplied too much longer. Lord, come back soon. You know, I can hardly walk. My hip hurts. My, my feet don't work, you know. And, and I could say other things. Going to, but I'm just saying, no, the body doesn't work like it used to, right? The body's breaking down. My, my foot hurts. You know, I was telling Gordon the other day, I don't know what I do when I preach on Sundays and I'm, I'm doing stuff. My, I go home and I complain. I shouldn't complain, okay? Because that's wrong. I'm just telling you not to complain. Okay, but I tell her that my foot hurts. The bottom of my foot hurts. 
And I, and I told Gordon, hey, just watch how I stand, because this foot, I, I think I'll put all my pressure here. And when I get home, the bottom of my foot's just aching. And it takes about three hours for it to go away. I put it up, you know, and stuff like that. And, you know, it's just that, I, I, you know, I'm hurting. This body is breaking down. The body is just, you know, but one day, one day this body's going to be made whole again. It's going to be made whole. And that's what it says. The knowledge of the Holy One and understanding, it gives us freedom to believe. And it goes on in verse 11, For by me your days are multiplied, and years of life are added to you. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself, and if you scoff, you scoff alone. So, in other words, you're wise to walk in Him. I got some other scripture from Jeremiah there. In fact, maybe I'll just... Um, I'll just end with this because there's a couple of warnings in here depending on how we walk with Him, okay? People seek for peace. Who doesn't seek for peace? The world's looking for peace. Peace. Peace in the Middle East. Peace. Peace. There's not going to be really any peace until the coming of Christ, okay? But here's what it says in Jeremiah, and we'll end here. Jeremiah 6, 11-15 says this. But I, God, I am full of the Lord. I am weary uh, with holding it in. Pour it out on the children in the street and on the gathering of your young, uh, of young men together. For both husband and wife shall be shaken, the aged and the very old. Their houses shall be turned over to others, their fields and their wives together. For I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, declares the Lord. For from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for gain. Uh, for gain and, from my pro- and, uh, and from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. Sound like the world? And they have healed the brokenness of my people superficially. I don't know, medicine, doctors, superficially, not spiritually. Saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. Were they ashamed because of the abomination they had done? They were not even ashamed at all. They did not even know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time that I punish them, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. Listen, we're in the end times. I believe end times are upon us. We're looking at everything that's going on in the Middle East. We see the alignment of Iran and Russia. And we see that, that uh, China and Russia have some, some common interests. And they're even aligning themselves. We know the armies from the north are going to come down. And, and they're going to come in and they're going to attack. We know that Israel one day is going to stand all by itself. Even the United States of America, which is beginning to happen now, is going to turn its back on Israel. But God chose Abraham and He chose the Jews for His victory so that all the world will see His glory when He comes down from heaven for that final time. And He lays His foot on Mount Zion and He walks through that east gate. He will be victorious. And then we will have the thousand year millennial reign of Christ where everything will be a peace. There will be one final battle and then the end will come and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Wow. What are we worried about? The world, like here, here, ought to worry. They ought to fret because listen to the warning that we have here in Jeremiah. But you who are walking in Christ, walk in faith, believe. Don't walk in unbelief. Walk in confidence knowing who you are in Jesus no matter what comes into your life. Okay, Lord, it's yours. I know you're going to work this for my good. I don't know what I'm, what I'm going through, why I'm going through this. But we are to give adoration and love to God, serve Him with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. Okay? Let your barn be full. Let your barn be full of the love of God. It's wonderful to walk in Him. I, I pray that, that we just leave this place today on fire for Him and we got this good news of Jesus. We got this good news of salvation. We have the good news that salvation has come to the earth. Why wouldn't we want to spread this around? Don't, don't worry what people are going to say. Don't worry about how people are going to label you. They're going to label you anyway. 
Walk in Christ. Spread the gospel. Invite people in so they can hear the word and be encouraged. Maybe a little convicted. I don't know. But so that God is glorified and that those, especially those that are wayward, that are living outside of the will of God, don't we want them to come into the kingdom? We receive them in freely. And then rejoice when that person we thought was so far gone, we thought that person could never be saved, and that person gets Jesus, you better watch out because that person is going to burn down the highway with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we receive them in. That's our goal. That's our desire. At least it should. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your word, and thank you for what you've showed us. I pray, God, I don't know where people are and their hearts are, Lord, but I pray there's some encouragement and conviction. I don't know, Lord Jesus, but I would take this time right now, Lord, to open up the altar, to come before you, to kneel in prayer just for a few minutes, to surrender those parts of our life we need to surrender, or to pray for somebody that needs prayer. I praise you in Jesus' name. I'm going to open up the altar. He is the way, He is the truth, He is the life. And nobody gets to the Father except through Him. So if you are in Christ, guess what? He is your way, He is your truth, He is your way to heaven. And that's all there is to it.